from the Acoustic Head and Perry Audio, and Goldstein. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so my name is Dan, and uh, I work for a company called Cherry Audio, uh, making virtual software synthesizers. And uh, I also work for another company called Acoustica, making recording software. And I collect and restore and maintain and repair old synthesizers. synthesizers. I've got the largest collection of these kinds of old keyboards in the state of Nevada. And I've been doing this for 25 years or so. Uh, I live here in the base, and um, today we're going to talk a little bit about the history of synthesizers and this kind of technology, where it came from, the sort of crazy path that it took to get to where we are today. Um, and then we're going to just at the end talk a little bit about the software that I make, uh, which is sort of a culmination of everything that I'm going to be talking about today. So it's kind of a weird, winding, twisted road that led from the invention of the synthesizer to the kind of technology that we have today. I call it a relatively brief history of the synthesizer. And we're going to not they we're going to skip a lot of people, and we're going to skip a lot of important instruments, but we're going to talk about some of the major people that influenced uh, these instruments, and the, basically every single kind of music that we listen to today. Um, as I said, I've been collecting and repairing and restoring these old synths for a long time. This is just a part of my collection. Uh, this is a more... And these old synths, these old instruments, they are not easy to maintain. Uh, a lot of them use electronic parts that don't exist anymore, that are hard to find. Uh, a lot of these haven't been made in 40 years. Um, and there's a lot of skills involved in maintaining them that are somewhat obsolete. Uh, but it's fun. And like anyone that has a passion for anything, pick it up, you figure it out, you, you learn how to keep these instruments going. They are important bits of history. Um, the electronic instrument uh, is pretty much as old as electricity. Uh, in 1902, the vacuum tube was invented. The first trial vacuum tube was invented. And one of the very, very, very first applications of this vacuum tube, uh, somewhat accidentally, was the production of an oscillation of tone. Uh, the first vacuum tubes were used for amplification, and when you don't know what you're doing and you over-amplify, you get feedback. Just like if you talk too loud into a microphone or put it too close to a speaker. And that feedback was harnessed to create some of the earliest, earliest uh, electronic instruments. This man, a, a Russian named Leon Theremin, invented what is probably the first commercially successful uh, weird electronic instrument. It's called the Theremin. Anyone ever seen one of these before? Yeah. They're weird. If you look at it, there's no keys. Uh, there's no nothing that would resemble a conventional musical instrument. And in fact, you play it by not touching it at all. Um, you can see there's an antenna sticking out the top and an antenna sticking out the side. And you play it by waving your hands around it in sort of an interesting way. So the way you play a pyramid is real weird. The vertical antenna on, on the right side, the closer your hand gets to the antenna, the higher the pitch. And the horizontal antenna on the left side controls the volume. The further your hand gets away from it, the louder the volume is. So to play it there and properly, it involves very minute and careful movements of your hand to control the pitch. This is Clara Rocky. She's 
could ever really play up there. And she's probably the best that there ever was. The theremin was invented in 1920. And throughout the 20s and 30s, she would put on concerts at Carnegie Hall with live symphony orchestras. Can you imagine if people would, would dress up in tuxedos and go out to see concerts of this weird box producing these otherworldly electronic sounds that nobody had ever heard? I mean, imagine that, right? Everybody here, we've always known organs and synthesizers and drum machines and music, but imagine having never heard a sound like that. Imagine how strange it would be to, to hear electronic sounds coming out of this weird box. This is Dr. Robert Moe. He was born in 1934, and as a teenager, he was fascinated by theorem. So much so that he began building them. He began building them and selling them. This is uh, one of his earliest theorems, possibly the first one that he ever built and sold. He made this when he was 18. His grandfather cut the wood for the cabinets. His mother typed the instruction manual on a typewriter. And as an 18-year-old, he sold these. And they became very popular. And he learned a lot about electronics and electronic music. In the 60s, the transistor showed up. Affordable, somewhat reliable transistors. And that opened up a whole world of music making possibilities because you could now build instruments, all kinds of new circuits, filters, and oscillators and envelope generators and ring modulators and all these bizarre, interesting circuits for shaping and storing sound out of transistors. And Bob Moog, he worked with a number of musicians in the New York area and other engineers, and he invented this, which you see here. This is the prototype of the Moog modular. This is in the Henry Ford Museum in Michigan. It is the first real synthesizer controlled by a keyboard. And what he did is he ripped a couple keyboards out of an organ and he started building all kinds of different circuits out of transistors that could be used to produce and shape and modify tones. And what you see here became ultimately the Moog module. This is the first commercial synthesizer. Uh, they were first made around 1964. And today they're worth an absolute fortune if you have them. But, uh, but this is where it all began. The Moog synthesizer. This is what's called a modular synthesizer. If you look at it, you can see that it's a wooden cabinet and it's made up of all these modules. Some of them are wide, some of them are kind of narrow. But every module does one task. Either a filter, or an oscillator, or an amplifier. And by taking cables and wiring the modules up to one another, you can produce sound. The instrument doesn't make any sound whatsoever without cables. You have to wire it up. It's a blank canvas. And it's up to the musician to figure out how to hook these things together to make a sound of it. So to a lot of musicians, it was incredibly experimental and incredibly interesting to have this box full of possibilities that you could use to make music. Uh, in 1968, this album came out. Anyone ever heard of Switched On Bob? Okay. Uh, Walter Carlos, later became Wendy Carlos, uh, this is her masterpiece. And what she did is she used the Moog modular synthesizer to synthesize the sounds of classical instruments, bassoons and violins and bass and, and the kinds of instruments that were used in Bach music. And using a multi-track recorder, she made these recordings of classical Bach songs, but made with the synthesizer. 
And again, we're all used to hearing synthesizers. We probably don't think anything of it. But when people heard this record, they heard music that was familiar to them, music that they'd heard before, but it wasn't right. It wasn't, it wasn't the instruments that they had heard the music played on before. And it was fascinating. And it sold incredibly well. Everyone went out and bought it in 1968. And it created a fad. What can only be described as a fad of Moog albums. Um, this is a pretty good one called The Age of Electronicus. Uh, this is a pretty bad one called Switch Down the Country. <laughs> I brought a little audio sample with so you can hear how bad this is. There were so many of these albums, and you'll find them at thrift stores, switched on rock and switched on, you know, everything. I mean, they're, they're disco, and people just kept making these albums. They, they sold uh, hundreds of these Moog modulars to musicians just to make these terrible Moog albums. So here, listen to a sample of Switched On Country. It's real bad. <laughs> So, um, because so many of these bad albums were, were made, uh, by the end of 1969, the fad kind of ended and people stopped buying them. I don't know why, I mean, you know, that's so good. <laughs> still listen to that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the fad sort of ended after a year or two, like fads do. And the Moog modular started to become less popular. And the Moog company needed uh, a new kind of product. Now, what they discovered was that people that bought these instruments they would ultimately end up doing the same sorts of things with the instruments. They'd take two or three oscillators, they'd run them into a filter, they'd run them into an amplifier, they'd use a couple envelope generators, and more often than not, when these instruments came in for repair, that's how they were patched up. They were all patched up more or less the same. So someone in Moog Music had, around 1969, 1970, a really clever idea. This being a mode modular, they created the mini mode. It's called a mini mode because it's small and portable. I've got one here on the stage. And this was a portable synthesizer that had all the basic elements of a mode modular. Three oscillators, a filter, an amplifier, a couple envelope generators, and it was in a package that was very portable and small. And at first, it was not a commercial success because no one knew, no one had ever seen a portable synthesizer before. Music stores didn't have a synthesizer department. They didn't know how to sell it. And people were weirded out by it a little bit. But uh, eventually, rock stars started using them. Uh, Keith Emerson and other musicians began recording some popular music with the mini mode. And uh, by about 1972, it, it took off. It was the biggest synth in the world. I'll play it just for a minute so you guys can hear it.
and they're still used, uh, they're prized by musicians today. The, the bass sound of these instruments on their way into Michael Jackson songs, all over disco music and rock music. Nothing sounded that deep, and because of the small portability, you could take them on stage, and they were a huge success. So much so that lots of other synthesizer companies were formed and started building similar portable instruments, like the R Odyssey, the Corgan S20, the Roland SH1. What all of these instruments have in common, and there's dozens of other similar instruments, what they all have in common. Similar instruments 
the Oberheim Lobby XA that's very famous to be heard on Van Halen's Jump. Uh, that's a direct copy of the Prophet 5. Uh, the Roland Jupiter 8, the Court Poly 6, the Moog Memory Moog, on and on. There were all these really, truly legendary synthesizers that all copied the ideas of hooking a microprocessor up to a single panel and letting you save the sound. And by the way, when I say you can save the sound, at the touch of a button, I can switch to a completely different tone. Again, that's commonplace on any instrument we see today, but in 1977, it was absolutely groundbreaking. So, these kinds of polyphonic analog synthesizers, they're, they're analog. What that means is that the sound is produced by transistors and resistors and capacitors and electronic components um, that are precisely tuned and in very careful circuits. And they're very imperfect instruments. They go out of tune. When they warm up, the hotter they get, the more out of tune they get. So the Prophet 5 has a button in the corner called Tune, it presses, and you have to wait about 20 seconds and the instrument will tune itself. And that will last a good 10 minutes or so before the instrument will slowly drift out of tune. Especially if you're on stage under hot lights, these things would go out of tune all the time. And these things would go out of tune constantly. So between every song, musicians were always having to stop and tune these instruments. In, uh, in the very early 80s, this is Professor John Chowning. He was working at Stanford University uh, on computer algorithms for producing sound. And he created something called linear FM synthesis which, I mean, you have to understand, we're talking 1980 or so, and computers were a whole lot slower than what we have today. But he created these algorithms on a computer that could produce incredible tones, sounds, digital sounds, that no one had ever heard before, and that were very easy for computers of the time to generate. And he started shopping this technology around. He patented it and began shopping it around. And Yamaha in Japan, none of the American companies were interested in what he was doing because they were building these analog synths and they were doing just fine. But Yamaha in Japan listened to what he had done and realized the potential of it. And they licensed his technology and created the Yamaha DX7. Anyone ever seen one of these? There's one here in the lab. Uh, at the school. Um, this thing was an absolute smash hit. It was a computer. It produced its sound digital. Every sound that came out of it was digital. Unlike the Prophet 5, which could play five notes at a time, this could play 16 notes at a time. And it was velocity sensitive, like a piano, meaning if you hit the key softly, it could play a quiet, gentle sound. And if you hit it hard, it could play a loud, brighter sound. None of, these, none of these classic instruments could do that. And overnight, this came out in 1983, and overnight it changed everything about music. So all of the music of the mid-80s became digital, and became full of these digital tones from the DX7. Uh, and what happened was, overnight, these old instruments became uncool. Just like that. And people took them and they put them in closets and they put them under their bed and everyone went out and bought a DX7. And the DX7 was an absolute smash hit. And every single company stopped making these old 70s analog synths and began making these new digital synths. The Roland D50, the Korg N1. These three synths, the DX7, the D50, and the Korg N1 are the are the three, to this day, the three best-selling synths that were ever made. But the best-selling instrument of all time was the Korg N1. Uh, this is a variation of a Korg N1, it's called a T3. It's the same thing, it's just got some extra sounds in it. Uh,
what made the M1 special is that it was what they call a workstation. Korg, the company that made this, coined the term workstation. It was not only a synthesizer, but it had built-in effects, digital effects, like reverb and delay and chorus. And it had a sequencer, a little recorder in it. So you could, with this one instrument, you could record and mix and produce an entire song. And it was revolutionary in that way. And everyone went out and bought a Korg M1 when it came out in 1988. And uh, they were just wildly popular. And as you can hear, I mean, you can hear the complexity of these sounds. They don't sound anything like these relatively basic, simple electronic sounds. Being computers, they could play back recordings of sound, like piano. And they could produce realistic saxophones and trumpets and organs and drums, uh, because, again, being software, they could record, they could take samples of audio, some short recordings of drums and pianos and organs, and play them back. So when you hit a key, you were hearing these, these actual instruments. And then you could blend choirs in with them, and strings, orchestras, and apply effects to them to make these big, lush sounds. And, uh, and that became music. All through the late 80s and the 90s, that became music. The other thing that happened when synthesizers went to, to be digital and computerized uh, was the invention of samplers. These were keyboards that were specifically designed to record sound and play it back. So you could record a drummer playing the drums and then you could loop that on the sampler and the, the instrument when you hit a key would just play that recording over and over. Or you could record somebody singing in a choir and then you could play the keys on it and play that choir sound all up and down the keyboard. And in that way, these instruments became incredibly realistic because they were no longer synthesizing sound. They were now just playing back recordings of actual sound. What happened in the 90s, as we got into the 90s, computers got more powerful, technology got more powerful, a whole bunch of musical instruments came out all of which were essentially variations on this kind of digital technology. But they, they got better and better and better. More memory, more sounds, better effects, more capabilities. Uh, if you remember, you could play five notes on this. You could play 16 notes on a chord in one. By the mid-90s, some of these instruments could play 128 notes at a time. Some of them could play 256 notes at a time. And you think, well, I've only got 10 fingers, but because you can hook these up to a computer, you can have drums and bass and guitars and everything playing simultaneously on these instruments. But something kind of interesting happened. Something very, very unexpected happened in the 90s. Every single instrument became alike. Every single keyboard that you went out and bought had a great sounding saxophone and a great sounding organ and a great sounding drum kit. And before you knew it, it didn't much matter which brand of keyboard you bought. They were all sort of the same. And they became bored. Musicians got bored by a lot of this technology. And by the end of the 90s, something really, really unexpected happened. Musicians went into their closets and under their bed, and they started pulling out these old synthesizers that they had put away in the 80s because they were obsolete. And they started plugging them in and listening to them. And they started hearing these deep, growling tones coming out of them. And they started remembering how much fun it was to reach out and grab the knobs and shape the sound. These instruments have no knobs. There's just buttons and menus and people began to realize that it was actually really fun back in the 70s when you had these old instruments. And it started something that we call the analog renaissance. 
No one could have predicted this. I mean, can you imagine today, can you imagine people going, hey, you know what, I miss black and white television. Like, let's pull <laughs> that old black and white TV out of the closet and start watching it again. It's so much better back then. But a whole new generation of musicians started playing these old instruments and started remembering how much fun they were. And then eBay came out, and the internet was everywhere, and people began buying and selling these old synths. And so there was a time when you could buy this keyboard right here for about $100. Nobody wanted it. No one wanted it. It'd give them away. Um, today, this particular instrument sells for about $3,500. And they're absolutely prized by musicians. Uh, but at the time, nobody wanted them. And then as musicians began to rediscover them, uh, they, they started trying to find them, and trading them, and buying them. This is Bob Moog up in the corner. Uh, in 2002, these instruments are so popular that he began manufacturing them again. He made this instrument, it's called the Mini Moog Voyager. If you remember, this was the Mini Moog. He made a modern version of the mini mode back in 2002 called the Voyager, a real analog synth. And so every company responded. There were several ways that they responded. Companies began building what they called virtual analog synths. These were digital synths, but they were covered in knobs and sliders, and they emulated the sound of analog synths. And they were okay, but they weren't really what people wanted. So then companies began making new analog synths. These were analog, real, true analog synthesizers, but with all the conveniences of modern day technology. They were reliable, they stayed in tune, they had MIDI, they could talk to your computer. And these instruments finally were what musicians wanted. And to this day, this is what the old hardware companies are doing. Korg is making vintage analog style synthesizers. Derringer is making analog synths. Roland is making analog synths. Uh, the next thing that happened is really kind of neat because after 2000, computers became really technologically advanced. They became pretty powerful. Every computer and everyone's, every musician's desktop was powerful enough to be able to run software emulations of these classic instruments. So, what this is, is Arturia's mini mode. It's a virtual software version of the real mini, with all the knobs and controls laid out the same, and a lot of very careful programming to replicate that sound of the original instrument. They, they, as time passed, these instruments got better and better and better, to the point where, on a recording, on a record, it's very difficult to tell the original sense uh, from the software emulations. This is Arturia's Prophet Pod. You'll notice it looks quite a lot like this because it's a software emulation of it. Uh, Core made an emulation of the M1. So this is their software version of the M1. What's cool about this kind of instrument, you know, the M1, I, I know. I don't know how well you can see this, but it's got a little tiny screen and a bunch of buttons. And it's not very easy to make new sounds on a core game one. But in the software version, well, there's all kinds of displays and dials and knobs, and it's really, really easy to see what you're doing. So not only does a software version of an M1 sound identical to the original hardware, because it's all just software. Uh, but they're so much easier to program and experiment with, which led to a lot of people taking these old instruments and figuring out new ways to make new sounds. The final piece of the puzzle, which surprised everyone, uh, is what's called Euro. As people went backwards in time and started playing with these old instruments, they became increasingly fascinated by these original giant modular synthesizers. Remember that giant mode modular with all the knobs and all the wires? 
it's next to impossible to actually play with those old instruments because they, they, ultimately there were only 300 remote modular systems ever made. And they're in universities and in private collections. But people became fascinated by the hardware and the capabilities and the limitless possibilities of being able to take wires and create sound any way you want. And they began manufacturing, dozens and dozens of small manufacturers began manufacturing new, small, inexpensive modules that could be put together into cabinets to create actual modular synthesizers. Uh, more and more companies got on board and people built bigger and bigger systems. And before you know it, uh, before anyone knew what was happening, today, modular synthesizers are bigger than they have ever been. They're incredibly popular. They are probably the most popular thing in the world of electronic music now. And there are dozens, possibly hundreds of, of small companies that continue to build modules. Now, these modules are not inexpensive. Uh, they're $100, $150, $200 a piece on average, and you have to buy a cabinet, and you have to buy power supplies. But they're still a whole lot cheaper than trying to find a 40-year-old vintage load modular uh, or arc modular or any of the other companies that end up making modular synthesizers. Um, and and this, is, uh, this has just become the most popular thing in music. And a couple years ago we launched a new company called Cherry Audio to build a piece of software that I wanted to build for years and, uh, and that software is called Voltage Modular. And I'm just going to demonstrate that very quickly. So Voltage Modular is a software recreation of a Eurorack modular synthesizer. What that means is in software, entirely in software, you can take modules, you can move them around any way you want, you can hook cables up and wire anything together. This software, the, the least expensive version of it is $29, the most expensive version is $99. So it's designed to be very, very uh, affordable and accessible and really the ultimate way to learn about synthesis and build whatever kinds of sounds you want. I'm just going to flip through a few sounds to see if you can hear what it does.
invention to becoming portable to becoming polyphonic to becoming digital and then all the way back to analog and then forward to the world of software that recreates the experience of analog hardware. It's a really strange and unusual path uh, that most of us in the industry and most musicians never saw coming. But that is the way things went. And the truth is that software like this, and like the other programs I showed you, they unlock uh, just a tremendous world of sound and sound potential. And versus these instruments, which can cost thousands of dollars and be really hard to maintain, um, the software emulations that are out there today are incredibly great sounding and very inexpensive. And most of the music that you listen to, most of it is made either with software recreations of these old instruments or occasionally with the old instruments themselves. Um, but that's it. That's, uh, that's my talk. Does anyone have any questions? So, how long has voltage been on? How long has this modular and the software has, has been um, up for? Like, how long has it been going for? Sure, sure. It came out, uh, well, what is it, November? It came out about two years ago. And part of what's really, really interesting about this, something I'm very proud of, is that anyone can develop modules for voltage modules. We made it an open system. So any computer programmer that wants to build their own modules can use our toolkit to create modules and then actually put them in our store and sell them. So there are, today there's over 400 modules for the software. There's over a dozen developers, third-party developers that are building uh, for the system. And it's expanding and growing. Um, one of the things that we just found out about yesterday that we're really proud of uh, in the December issue of Computer Music Magazine, which is just hitting the, the mailbox of subscribers right now, uh, just about the whole issue of the software is dedicated, or the issue of the magazine is dedicated to voltage module. So they put it all over the cover and they created a, a 19 page tutorial series and a whole bunch of videos. Uh, the, the software took some time, like any new product does. We were, we're a new company, we had a new product that took some time uh, for people to try it out and accept it. And the community has just grown and grown. We have over 20,000 users of the software today. Um, and that number just keeps expanding. And uh, we're going to be having a Black Friday sale in a few weeks. So we expect that number to just kind of go nuts because there are a lot of people that keep writing to us and saying, hey, where's your next sale? Um, but yeah, the software's been out for something like two years, uh, maybe a little less. It's all sort of a blur now. <laughs> uh, maybe a year and a half since it was officially released. Um, and, uh, and yeah, as I said, the community has just exploded and the, some of the third-party modules that, are, uh, that have been created are just, you know, they're just stunning to me. Uh, things that I never would have thought of, things that sound amazing. Any other questions? I, I was expecting there's a couple of these around the VCD record versus the next one. What's the technical differences? Or? Um, the, what are the differences between the, the various platforms that are out there? Um, most every other virtual modular synthesizer that's out there is a closed system. So there are a few companies like Softube makes a product called Softube Modular. Arturia makes a, uh, a version of the, the mode modular, the large mode modular. But these are closed systems. They contain so many modules and, and, and that's, that's it. Uh, our system, and you asked about VCD RAP, uh, those are the only two systems that are out there that are open systems that anyone can develop for. There are a number of differences between what we've done and, and BCB RAP. BCB RAP is an open source system. There's no company behind it. Um, the, the primary difference is that developing modules for voltage modular um, is a very, very simple thing. Because we have a whole piece of software where you just visually lay out your knobs and your jacks in any order that you want and you write a little bit of code. The, the language, the programming for these modules is all done in Java, which for programmers is a very relatively easy language to program in. 
and it makes all of the modules cross-platform. So every single module will run on Mac and on PC without, any, without anyone having to know anything about the differences between those platforms. Everything just kind of works. Um, our system is a little more elegant. Uh, the, the workflow is a little bit easier. Um, but they're both, uh, they're both excellent systems. And, and the fact that we live in a world where there are choices for people to be able to, to get a hold of software that emulates modular synthesizing is, is pretty remarkable. I mean, there was a time when the only way you got to touch this kind of technology was to go to a major university and uh, ask very, very nicely and they would let you into the room with the old modular in it. Uh, and now, anyone, please, yes. Um, thank you. As a, thank you for the, the talk. It was, it was kind of walk down the memory lane. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was surprised that as you kind of walked through the 80s and transitioned from analog to more of the, the, the rise of the rock or music thing, that one, I'm surprised you didn't touch on like the Kurzweil 8250. Um, I, I think that a lot of what the other companies are doing, like the like M1s and the, the original that generation, they were all just playing catch up oh, yeah. to, to what Kurzweil did, especially given Kurzweil's uh, contributions to the overall uh, since this universe, I was, I was that it wasn't. And that's a, an excellent question. I own a Kurzweil K250. It's a massive, gigantic instrument. And as I said at the beginning, I mean, there, there's just no way to tell the history of synthesizers in 45 minutes. Um, the K250, the Kurzweil K250, there are so many pioneers in synthesis. And the Kurzweil K250 is one of the most interesting instruments because it was invented by Ray Kurzweil. And some of you may have read his books. He's a futurist. He writes all these books about how computers are going to get faster and faster and better and better, and then they're going to become smart, and then they're going to take over the world. That's, he's just got tons of books that all sort of tell that, that story. Um, he built a machine called the Kurzweil Reading Machine, or Optical Reader, or something like that. It was a machine in the around 1980 or so, that you could put a book in, and a camera would scan the book, and a synthesized voice would read the, the words of the book. And this was very useful for blind people, the people who couldn't, couldn't read for one reason or another. So Stevie Wonder had one of these Kurzweil reading machines, and he thought it was amazing. He thought it was the most amazing thing he'd ever seen. And he contacted Ray Kurzweil, who invented the machine, and he said, there's something I want you to build for me. I want a keyboard that's portable, that I can take with me places, that when I hit keys on it, it actually really, truly sounds like a grand piano. Um, there was nothing like that. The only way to get the sound of a grand piano at the very, very early 80s was to bring a grand piano with you on stage. And there were companies that made Portable, portable, quote unquote, grand pianos that weighed hundreds of pounds but could be set up on stage, and they kind of universally failed to sound like a grand piano. So Stevie Wonder said, I want the sound of a grand piano. And Ray Kurzweil invented uh, a synthesizer called the Kurzweil K250 that was the earliest machine with this kind of technology that actually contained recordings of a piano and could play them at different pitches across the keyboard. And it was so good, it was so good that today, it's still, I mean, we've come so far since then, but it's still one of the best sounding digital pianos ever made. So much so that um, back when, when David Letterman was on the air, uh, um, his uh, musical director, Always, from the beginning of that show until whatever, 10 years ago when he retired, uh, he always had a Kurzweil K250 on stage with him, everywhere he went. Uh, a, a definitely a terrific instrument, and in a lot of ways, the instrument that started the idea of, of instruments that played back samples, recordings of sound. Um, the only reason why I didn't mention it was it cost $7,000 or something when it was new, and it was not something most musicians had. Uh, access to. Not like the, the M1, which was so popular that it became, and so expensive and affordable, 
that it just became the best selling keyboard of all time. Uh, any other questions? Oh, well, uh, in that. What sort of control options can you use with this? Because, I mean, obviously, clicking knobs and stuff sucks. Right. So, MIDI controllers, all that, you could just plug in whatever and, and go to town? Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, I didn't really have a, I, I just have this little USB controller with me, but uh, in the software, you can right click on any knob and click on MIDI Learn and turn any control on your controller and it'll automatically map. Um, every single control, when the software is run inside of a DAW, inside of recording software, uh, every control is automatable. Um, the software runs on Windows and Mac. It's available as an audio unit, as a VST. It runs in Pro Tools or Pro Tools versions of it. So uh, it works with you know any kind of control hardware and um, pretty much any platform. Nice. Uh, oh, you had a yeah. So like through all the years you've been doing synthesis, you've been messing around with synthesis. What is it the thing? What is the thing about synthesis that like keeps you up at night and like still like the next day tries to make you venture for something new or something new to discover or something that always a problem you always run into with synthesis that you can never figure out? Like, is there something like that for you? Yeah, that's a great. That's a fantastic question. Um, the um, the thing about synthesizers to me that has always been exciting. Um, is ultimately the ability to create a sound that's in your head and you have an idea for a sound. You know, if I want a flute, I can... It would only be our ideas, it would be limited to the things that we could dream of. 
by making it an open platform, it's open to the world. And someone out there is going to come up with the next amazing synthesis idea, and we could end up in a program like this. Yes? What's the weirdest module somebody has made for this? Hmm. Boy, what's the weirdest module? We're just like, what the hell, man? And then you try it out, and you're like, all right, this is kind of funky. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, what a lot of people are doing, and what we've been doing uh, ourselves, is taking sections of these old instruments. Like, there's an instrument called a poly mode that Moog made. Uh, before the Prophet 5 came out, Moog, the company that made the mini mode, they wanted to try to make a polyphonic synthesizer. And they didn't know how to do it because they were not computer people. You really need a microprocessor to make that work. So, what they did was they built an organ. And then they adapted it to, so that every single key had a filter and an envelope generator, and it was a mess, and it never worked. Um, but they had some interesting ideas in this instrument. Uh, so there's some very unusual filters that are in the instrument. And what we did is we created a module that emulates that section of what is an otherwise not great synthesizer. I think probably the I don't have a great answer to what the weirdest module is, but I think the one that surprised me the most um, was we, there, there was an artist, a graphic artist, and he didn't know anything about making sound. He wanted to make blank panels that were full of art, and that's what he did. He came up with a whole series of modules that you can just kind of use in between your other modules that have uh, 30, 40, 50 different visual images on them. Some of the art's really beautiful. But I never in a million years saw that coming. Yeah, could, yeah just graphical spacers. That yeah, have yeah. But the aesthetics of an instrument like this are, are important. And, you know, and, and people download that module all the time. They like it. Is, is, are all the modules virtual analog based or oh, no. are any like hybrid stuff that moves like weight based? Or, Oh, there's all kinds of stuff. We have, um, there's a company called Misfit Audio that has a whole suite of modules that contains samples of digital drum machines. So they, they, they have modules that emulate analog drum machines like the TR-808, 909, but they also make modules that play back digital recordings of, uh, of classic drum machines. We have a module called Sampler 1 and another one called Sampler 2 that allows you to take digital samples and warp them and play them back as part of a modular synthesizer. Um, there are, uh, there's at least one developer working on a wavetable module, um, although we may end up making our own wave because we've got some ideas for ways to do that. But yeah, by, by no means is it meant to be analog only. I mean, there are some very, uh, very digital effects and some very digital modules. The beauty of a modular synthesizer like this is you choose what modules you want to use. If you want to sound like the 1970s, you can do that. If you want to sound like crazy modern sounds, you can do that too. It's, it, there's just no limit, it's up to you. Um, that's all the time I've got, so I, I think uh, we'll end it there, but I'll be around if any of you have any questions or want to play with the software or want to try out the synths. Um, thank you very much, thanks to the College of Southern Nevada, and I'd like to thank John Jacobs for the